thank you for having me. Um, I am Bill Durant, and uh, a friend of mine and I, it, we were in Sacramento uh, doing Nikon school one time, and, and we came across this mural. It was a little segment of the roof, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So to say that I feel blessed is an awkward sort of, of uh, construct in language for me, but I have been very fortunate in my career. I've been working in some aspect of photography for well over 50 years now. I think most of us in the room are old enough to know this by now. Uh, life is this constant change, and, and it's certainly been that for me, and it was a struggle early on accepting that, and uh, at some point I think I began to glorify in that. I love that constant change, the way things are always coming at you. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine gave me a copy of a picture he had shot on St. Patrick's Day here. We do have a little bit of a celebration on St. Patrick's Day. But the dog we had at the time always managed to turn green on St. Patrick's Day. And he shot this picture that day, and he gave me this. But he had also been digging through some old photographs he had, and he handed me a little 4 by 6 print of another party that my wife and I had been to when we first started dating. <laughs> Change is constant. Change is always happening. And although Darwin is often credited with this quote, it's actually from uh, a much more contemporary person, but it certainly fits in with the Darwin mindset. How we change, how we adapt to change, because it's not going to stop. How we adapt is key. I um, started very young. Uh, this was me and my first camera, uh, two years old. And actually, the camera didn't work, but Mom said the only way I would hold still for her to take my picture was if she gave me one to play with, and I think she started something uh, at that point. When I really first started getting into shooting some pictures, of course, I was much older. I was 17. Now, this is a really bad color negative, okay? I did not wear lipstick then or now. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, at 17, of course, the pictures I shot were friends you know, personal activities, that kind of stuff going on. You know, you'll notice there's a theme to who my friends were. Uh, <laughs> but tell me this, when was the last time you saw a 16-year-old at a sweetheart dance or a Valentine's dance wearing white gloves or the boys being in suits and ties? Change, change happens. A year later, I was much more sophisticated. And I was working at the newspaper, and the newspaper was the first real job I had, which spoiled me forever, because I didn't have to sit somewhere with a supervisor. I was out all day roaming around. I worked nights. I worked weekends. I was ruined for any regular job ever again. Uh, but it was all kinds of stuff, features, uh, news stuff. The NS Savannah was decommissioned and brought back to Savannah. City Hall. Uh, I actually have an office just right here now, um, which I never would have thought would happen. The Army asked for a little bit of my time. Um, so I spent three years in the Army uh, in Washington. Uh, I have changed uh, a little bit, not only grayer, but thicker uh, these days. But the, my assignment in Washington uh, was fascinating. It was mostly lab work uh, for the White House Photo Lab. But I did occasionally do some shooting. This was at a country fair that was on the South Lawn uh, at the White House. I did some other shooting as well. A friend was helping run a Northern Virginia talent contest or something like that. So just doing things like that, just a mix of things. One of the things that was really fun about the assignment I had, though, was uh, some of the things I got to see and do, um, none of which were top secret, but except for how much money we were spending. And they didn't want Congress to know that. That was the only real secret. But um, it was great. You used to be able to just line up at the White House and go on a tour. Uh, I'm sure that that's not possible anymore, but because of the assignment I had, I could arrange for the earlier morning tour where you got special access, and uh, so it was great to have my mom and dad uh, to be able to go up and, and do that. Uh, in pulling these pictures out for this presentation, I tell you, this was a real strange walk down memory lane for some of this stuff because I got to looking at this picture, and this is not at all. My dad passed away some time ago, mom just a few years ago, and this is not at all how I remember my mother. Uh, she is 30 years younger here than I am now, so um, things change. I went back to newspaper work for a little bit, and I think over that intervening time and paying a lot of attention, one of the things that, that I think has always been useful for learning how to be a better photographer is to do lab work. 
If you want to know how somebody's making mistakes shooting pictures, print them. And you'll learn a lot from that and how, what not to do as much as what to do. And I think I became a better photographer, both working both with breaking news, spot news, as well as features, the kind of stuff they'd always send you out to find if they had a hold of the newspaper they needed to put some artwork in that day. But this was probably the beginning of the end for photojournalism for me as well, because there are aspects to it that are difficult to take. This was Christmas Eve, about uh, four or five blocks from here, uh, and that was a tough one. I wound up quitting the paper and going back to school in the GI Bill at the University of Georgia, and of course while I was there, getting my degree in journalism, I hadn't understood yet that I wasn't going to be following that path. But uh, doing some routine stuff for the, the red and black school paper, sports and concerts, a young Stephen Stills here. Um, and the great streak in. At one point during this uh, a very early spring week at Georgia was when so much of the streaking activity was going on around the country. The number is because campus security stood on the end, uh, around the corners of all the entrances to the quad where the end point was and counted everybody that came in naked. 1,563 people took off all their clothes and ran from one end of campus to the other at the University of Georgia that night. It was a glorious spectacle. Uh, I miss college. While I was there, I, I got drawn into the art department because they had a wonderful program, or what I heard was a wonderful program. Um, and it was, I went through the full course sequence called Photographic Design. And I think it started changing the way I think about photography more as a tool than as a, a product. And of course, the professor who really became the most important mentor in my life, uh, after something like a dozen years of working in photography, I finally got the foundation that I'd never gotten from my army photo school or from all the other photo work I had done, understanding simple things like depth of field and managing motion, I mean, just real basic stuff. I got a lot of that from him, but we also did a lot with alternative processes. We were working with color key materials, we were using paper negatives, just taking Kodachrome, I'm sorry, Kodabromide F2 or F3 paper and putting it in large format cameras and shooting with it. And then uh, maybe shooting paper negatives and printing them back. Could be doing experimental things like shooting a paper negative and drawing the paper negative and then printing them both at the same time to see how that worked out. Uh, another direct camera process we started playing with was Cibachromes. Uh, some of you probably worked with Cibachrome. I think it was ultimately called Ilfachrome. Um, we actually had a bunch of it as part of a senior project several of us worked on. Uh, we were shooting it directly in camera. So this was actually a 4x5 uh, camera that I just had put um, Cibachrome in and made direct exposures with. So playing with things like that. And a big part of this program was pinhole work. Uh, this is actually a pinhole image. Uh, we actually had to make pinhole cameras and do a lot of stuff with it, but this was a pinhole optic that we made for our 35 millimeter cameras. But I knew the f-stop and I could calculate my exposures. This was no, you know, oatmeal box with a hole poked in it. The, everything about this man that I worked with and learned from was control. You had to have control of the process, you had to have repeatability built into it. And that was one of the great things that it was a carry away from that for me, working with him. Now while I was there, my dad got sick and eventually ultimately died, but I took a little time off from school and managed to spend some time with him. And we spent some time out in the countryside where he grew up, and it was a lot of things, going to cane grindings and um, some things like this. Uh, this was a pond draining. One of the things they'll do out in the country is to create a grist mill. They'll take a stream and they'll dam it up, and then when they build up a big pond with some pressure behind it, they'll let the water flow through a little spillway that turns the grist mill. But every so often, they have to drain the pond because to, to help the bigger, the stronger fish in there will get so big that you're not really getting much of a fish population anymore. So they'll drain the, the pond down to almost nothing and walk through with a seine and just clean out the big fish. So did some of that. Wound up back in Savannah, but at this point, journalism was pretty much history for me. And wound up starting to do a lot more commercial work. Um, just a variety of things from resorts to industrial agricultural. This was actually a bank photograph. Uh, if you need encouragement to become a vegetarian, <laughs> spend three days in a meat packing plant. It'll do it for you. Hit a low point professionally. Uh, things weren't going well. 
And I, through some friends, I wound up getting a job just basically being a manual laborer on a drilling operation for about a year and a half, working out in Mississippi and that area generally. And so it really became what I think of now as a sabbatical. I had been working in photography for a number of years, but I had been doing it since I got out of high school. I didn't feel like I had ever made the choice to do that. It was just the jobs that I wound up with. In that year and a half, I discovered my love of photography and that I really wanted to keep doing it, that it was something that I was doing for myself. And the other part of this was I was so broke that I was making pictures like this. When I went out there for the first several months that I was there, I had two rolls of Kodachrome 25 36 exposure film and two prepaid processing mailers. And those 72 frames were all the film I had. Now, I had spent a whole career up to that point having all the film I ever needed because I, you know, got it from whoever I was working for. Now I had to make 72 frames last two to three months. So every picture became a challenge, one picture. That's all. Get it right or don't get it. And so it became a real challenge and a discipline to me to work through this as well as just exploring places like Mississippi, old tar paper shacks, farmland, the levee system in northern Mississippi and the uh, the Delta country, uh, at one time, at one part of the year, the water would be here. At a different time of year, you couldn't see the trees. We wound up in Puerto Rico for a few weeks doing some of the work there at the Luguia Beach or out on the west end of Puerto Rico near Aguadilla. I'm, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Aguadilla. Back home, back in photography, I wound up at Nikon. And it was another one of those absolutely amazing experiences. One of the great things about what we were doing as a tech rep, of course, is you got exposed to all kinds of things. So I wound up at Olympia. We worked a lot of different media events. In addition to the specific client work I did, calling on newspapers, working with this organization, that sort of thing, we also provided support at media events. So we might be at the Olympics. We'd be at shuttle launches. This is the Discovery launch, which uh, was the first launch after the Challenger explosion. This. Uh, was what they called a sunset rollback, where the night before the launch, they would take you out all around the, the, the shuttle to do a variety of photographs. Uh, this is fake. Uh, but it was tougher then, because you had to do it in camera. So that's a real in-camera, multiple exposure. That's not Photoshop. And then, after I'd been there a few years, uh, they reactivated the Nikon School program. The Nikon School program I had actually gone to many years earlier. Loved it, and I had really uh, learned to love teaching. And so I, I was thrilled when they asked me to be part of the team that put the Nikon School back on the road, and I spent the next 22 years teaching Nikon School, first as an employee, and then when we started the digital version of the school, I was a contractor working with a, another company uh, that was doing that. And it was great. Now, first off, again, this is part of these learning curves that I've been through constantly in my life. First off, starting to talk about basics, how to teach people about basic photography, talking about shutter speeds. How do, you, how do you change your shutter speed? Why do you change your shutter speed? Why, are, why do you have that choice? Or depth of field. You know, what's depth of field about? But these were the kinds of illustrations I did early on that were very basic. As I did more and more of this, started understanding ways to talk to people about things like, well, it's not just that if you use a faster shutter speed or a slower shutter speed, this happens. Why do you? make those choices. Obviously, if you want to freeze something like this, you've got to have a faster shutter speed, but if you freeze this 200 mile an hour car, that could be parked there. Where's anything about 200 miles an hour there? So learning how to use these things to make a little bit more uh, choices to illustrate the point that you're talking about. Uh, how do you use shutter speed to tell the story that you're trying to tell? Or depth of field. How does that change? And, and what is the difference? What's the point of those changes? So just talking about those things. But then more and more getting into a little bit more complex ideas about teaching photography. Things like photography is really a point of view. There is no, tr I mean, this, I'm sure most of you have heard the old notion, the camera doesn't lie. That's absolute nonsense. Every photograph out of camera is a simple limited truth at best. Limited by point of view, limited by the frame, what you've included, what you've excluded. And so just doing nothing more here at Disney, but moving over to the right a little bit, you start seeing how point of view changes everything. What do you know about this scene? It's limited by the frame. 
the, 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 the old sort of commonly accepted wisdom about uh, longer lens compresses uh, distance, which is not true. It has nothing to do with the lens, of course. It has to do with the shooting distance. And so creating illustrations to show that I'm getting this compression not because I'm shooting with a long lens, and I don't get this expansion because I'm shooting with a wide lens. If I come way back here and shoot from the same distance with a wide lens and then crop that, I've got the same perspective. So just learning, this was a big thing for me with Nikon School is, is it started teaching me how to teach, how to illustrate things that get beyond just showing. One of the things I started discovering was you can't just show a pretty picture and say this is the way to do it. You gotta show the one before. And that was a big difference because I had spent most of my life at that point learning how to work mentally through the process to the final picture and then shooting the final picture. And learning that you had to shoot through the process, you needed all of those pictures to help people understand where you were going. So what does that really mean in terms of how you manage the scene and the information in the scene? Well, I can shoot from a distance and have this couple's relationship to St. Peter's very different than if I shoot next to them and have a very different kind of feel for their relationship to St. Peter's. If I want to see the scene and the person, I, I can't do it this way. I have to learn to manage that distance, manipulate the distance in the, in the relationship between these subjects by the camera position and the choice of lens. Compositional issues like framing, uh, rule of thirds, brighter subjects attract attention. We read left to right, all kinds of things like that. And then as other things that were happening to me as I was going along, of course, always, I mean, I think everybody's interested in pretty flower pictures. Most people are, certainly. And uh, doing more and more of that, but not just you know, using a, a, a micro lens or macro lens if you're using the wrong brand. Um, actually, there's no wrong brand anymore, I guess. But, um, but working with close-up lenses to do this stuff, but then starting to get into the real technical parts of this. And some of this was driven by my relationship with this organization, is not only the medical piece of it, making sure that there was a reference point. I, the first time I did this, I just shot this on gray. Well, how do you know what size it is? So having that reference point, uh, the relationship, but then learning about the varying ways to get all the way down to this level of magnification, actually taking the old Nikon bellows at full extension with a 20 millimeter lens, reverse mounted on the front of it to get to, I think this was an 11 times magnification, and I can't believe I remember that after all these years. Other technology that I started getting into, as an old photojournalist, I tended to avoid flash, uh, mostly because I didn't understand it. Uh, but we were getting new technology in flash with uh, balanced flash, TTL flash, and multiple TTL flash. And so this trip that Barbara and I took to Santorini, I could photograph her with my old skills, or I could photograph out the window. But all I had to do was turn on the flash now to be able to get this kind of balance. And so instead of this, I could get this. And some of these are really bad scans from film images. But uh, just being able to, to tell the system, give me a better picture not even having to understand it so much, although I am compelled when I start seeing stuff like this to understand why it's happening. And then learning to work with this multiple flash and TTL so that I could get some variation uh, working with the different pictures. Learning to use this as a way to manipulate the scene. This is not Barb looking at a sunset out the window. This is just a flash there with a filter on it. Um, and then I met Leon. I, I know that there's a bunch of people here uh, and I haven't, I, I assume Leon's passed away at this point, but Leon was special. Not that everybody isn't, of course. But when I went to that week long, first time I went to that week long workshop that was in Rochester, there was some amazing people there, some great classes, I learned a whole bunch, but I went into Leon's workshop, and I think it was about a dozen different lighting setups for mostly small object photography. And he had created all of these different kind of lighting scenarios based on what the subject was that you were working with, what you were trying to photograph. And working with him on this kind of stuff, you know, working with light tents or whatever it might be, because we had all of this new stuff, he was using fiber optic tubes and a bunch of other different kinds of technology, but all older stuff. And so because we had this new multiple flash TTL stuff, we started working together to adapt all of his setups to use new, the newer equipment. And so uh, using the multiple flash units, 
for instance, to, to do the light tent work. But then I started playing with this too to try to figure out easy, cheap ways to do some of this stuff if you didn't have you know, a, a budget to go out and buy light tents and things like that. So just taking kitchen bowl and cutting the hole out of it get you away from this and get you to this, or get you to this by just doing something like this. Instead of having a fiber optic light, just taking an old oil filter, a funnel, and hammering it down so it fit on the front of the flash to get that beam of light coming across. This kind of thing, just figuring out how to do that, but also knowing that there are opaque pieces of this that I need to be able to see as well. So adding that second flash, just pick this up. Cross polarization. This was a revelation to me. Uh, being able to get this kind of detail instead of this, just with that technique. And of course, I always wanted to figure out how to do that with the sun in a single lens. And if you've got an idea, if you've got a, a, an answer for that, I'd like to hear it because I would walk, I would wear polarized sunglasses sometimes and I'd be driving down the road and I'd be seeing stuff and they were warm colored as well. And I'd see something that was absolutely gorgeous in the landscape and I'd jump out of the car and I'd grab my tripod and my camera bag and get, around, get all set up and I'd take off my sunglasses. Oh. You know, I learned to take off my sunglasses before I got all the equipment out at some point. <laughs> but um, but cross-polarization was a revelation. I just, I loved that kind of thing. So I just learned so much uh, technical. It was just constantly being put in these situations where I'd learned so much from other people. And I thought that was great. And because of the life sciences orientation of this group, I started being drawn toward a little bit broader aspect of that, and in particular nature and wildlife work. And this is where... Bill and I, I think first met he was running something called the Great American Photography Workshop and or weekends initially and I started attending some of those as the Nikon rep and just really got in to, to that aspect of photography and, and loved the wilderness uh, I actually am a hermit by nature and could spend my whole life out away from nobody uh, which begs the question about the last change in my life I, I ran for office I, that there's there's no understanding of that but <laughs> But being able to get out into the wilderness like this, uh, just shooting, working with this, this was just thrilling. I love this. And inevitably, as you're doing this, uh, you learn lessons. I mean, one of the things I learned, I think I was actually with Bill, maybe in Yellowstone for this. Uh, one of the things that you learn about doing this kind of stuff, too, is important things. So valuable lessons um, that I'm learning all along. And then, of course, the, the treasure, the prize uh, for wildlife photography is to get to Africa and to be able to do safari. And I've actually had the chance to do three now. Uh, and it's, it's just amazing. It's the most amazing trip. Uh, in Serengeti. And, of course, when you're doing that, you're going to be bumping into people, too. It's not just going to be wildlife. And so you're expanding this. And it's not only even just people but the kind of landscape stuff that you start discovering. Back home, well, home, Oregon, but yeah. And learning to work with subtle changes with this kind of stuff. Um, this perfectly adequate straight photograph works fine, uh, wildflower uh, group. Um, and to get to that photograph required working with, here's the little mariposa lily and the camera set up here, but using a translucent dome to soften the light coming from the sun, the gold reflector to warm the light to go from this to this, just little things like that. A big change then was that transition to digital, learning the technology, and that was a struggle for a while. I mean, it was, you know, for me anyway, there was a lot. It, it turned out there were some fantastic tools, and I never want to go back to film again. Uh, and scanning some of these film images for this, I discovered how much better my digital files are just technically than any of the film images I ever shot, I think. But, you know, learning about flashing highlights and working with histograms. Uh, took a little while, struggled with it a little bit, uh, but doing that, understanding about, e even though we had a kind of a basic understanding about color temperature, but the tool of, of white balance settings, just being able to have that white balance setting so that you knew, well, that's wrong. This is what it's supposed to be, but I like that better. So not only understanding how to use white balance, but how to use it wrong on purpose, that sort of thing. How do we actually make sure we're seeing accuracy in this? 
And so another option back then would have been, it could just be an artifact of the photographic process. I mean, we had CRT monitors that, I mean, color was for crap. You know, we, we had no reference point that we, we could really use. But in, the, in light of all of that, I think it's still important that we remember that it's still about photography more than it is about hardware. Hardware we need for certain kinds of things. So I was doing a week-long trip from Phoenix to Denver a few years ago, and I hit a lot of the high points uh, through that, that area, from the Slot Canyons, Antelope Canyon, to the area around Monument Valley, the, the mittens at Monument Valley. And I had a car full of Nikon gear. Multi every camera body we made, an assortment of all the lenses from probably a fisheye to the 600, um, multiple flash units, and the way I would travel on a road trip like this is the stuff scattered all over the inside of the car. It's not in cases anymore because I'm just grabbing stuff and using it sometimes. So, um, but as I started that trip, going on, I started just doing some sampling at first, and then the whole trip became about this. All these pictures were made with a little point and shoot camera that cost less than the tripod it's sitting on. And it became that exercise in seeing. How do you make a good picture? It's not about the hardware. Oh, Something I had wanted to do for a long time was more international travel. I was beginning to see a lot of the U.S., but I wanted to see more. And Bill called me one day and said, I'm supposed to be leaving for a workshop, to take a, a group on a workshop in Ireland in, I think it was just three or four days, something like that. I can't go. Uh, can you fill in for me? And so I did my first international workshop in Ireland, thanks to Bill, and I haven't stopped. I'm looking for every opportunity to travel as much as I can today. And, and I've had the chance to see some amazing things from the coast of Maine to Bangladesh, Cuba. Taking workshop groups like this, this is an Angkor Wat in Cambodia, or trips that my wife and I do by herself in Borneo on a trip into the jungle where she twists her ankle and has to be carried around like a princess the whole time we're in the jungle. So from Italy, to France, Prague, the top of the Alps in Switzerland. We got up there, you get off this car lift that takes you up to something like, I, I don't, it was the top of the Alps, it was really high up, I don't remember, it was summertime of course, but you get off the lift and there's a big sign in four languages that says essentially, if you die, it's not our fault. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we hear the sound, it's kind of like singing and we, roam around until we find this, and it's this little group of nuns with a couple of priests doing a birthday mass for one of the nuns. It's just the serendipity of so much of the stuff I've experienced in my life, and I've been so excited about it. And one of the things I always remember, uh, one of the workshops, again, from Bill, uh, we, that those programs that he was doing were so good because I mean, we had the, the, the royalty there to talk to us, Galen Rowell and John Netherton and John Shaw. Um, I, Pat O'Hara, Brian Peterson, God, Franz Lanning, Art Wolf. It was an amazing group of people to be able to work with. There's more. I'm just not remembering all the names. But Brian Peterson said something at one of the classes one time that I always remembered. He said, if you'll just put yourself out there, good things will happen for you. And I think he's right. You just go. You just go. You have to go. You can't shoot it if you don't go. But then Pat O'Hara at another workshop after that said something that I remembered and liked even better. He said, if you put yourself out there, even if the picture doesn't happen, isn't it just nice to be there? So remember that tomorrow morning if you get up at 4 o'clock and don't find a pretty picture, okay? Blue Mosque in Istanbul, Floating Market in Bangkok, Yellow Mountain in China in the middle of a political rally in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and this is the strange thing to me about the world we live in. I mean, most of us have some, some pretty standard ideas about Islam. In Bangladesh, there are two primary political parties, both Islamic parties, and both of them are headed up by women, which is not what I'd expect in an Islamic state. And no hostility, no confrontation, nothing, very interesting. A centuries-old wholesale produce market in Bangladesh. The most beautiful building in the world, I'm convinced. How many of you have been to the Taj Mahal? I tell people, if no matter how beautiful 
you think it is. When you get there, it'll be better than that. It's an amazing thing. Beautiful. Street vendors in India. This fever dream in Varanasi uh, of the late night chanting. You've, you've been there on the ghats. Um, Vietnam. Borneo. And then my, my official life changed three years ago. I ran for public office. You know, my wife said, you got to find something to do to get out of the house. Um, and I didn't really want the job so much as I didn't want the woman that had it to stay there. Uh, she was so bad. So I ran. I won. And I still use photography some uh, in, in my political life today. Uh, starting out with our inauguration at the Civic Center, uh, this is the, our uh, new mayor was being sworn in just before the rest of us were sworn in. There are eight councilmen, council people, and, and the mayor and the other eight of us are sitting there on the stage waiting our turn to be sworn in. Uh, the other seven have their Bibles with them. I have my camera. <laughs> Priorities. Another thing that I use photography for today, uh, combined with my history, is to do presentations, some stuff I've done recently, about how time has changed the city from our old pier uh, that burned in 1967 to the new pier that we have at the beach. Uh, a photograph of a friend back in the 70s walking along this little dirt path out on the south side of town and standing in exactly the same position what that looks like now. Uh, just the kind of changes that have happened here. And to come full circle, after my experience in France last year, I'm sorry, in 2016, with that one little camera to see how I liked it, I went through the very, I had been shooting Nikon equipment since 1968. And I just knew that I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't carry all that equipment around. I wasn't going to shoot pictures like that anymore. So I swapped everything I had in for another Fuji body and a couple more lenses and a flash, which I still haven't used. And, um, and took, instead of a 50 pound camera bag, I took an eight pound camera bag to Myanmar uh, last fall when my wife and I went there. And it was just, again, so great to just be able to have the spontaneity of a cooking class we were in, quickly just shoot the meal that I had prepared. I made that. Now, I had a lot of help and a lot of instruction, and I couldn't do it again if my life depended on it, but I made that. And it was fabulous. Just, you know, the, the kind of stuff that, it, the, the freedom that I have working with this equipment today, this is a pedestrian bridge across a small lake in Mandalay that has this you know, huge afternoon sunset activity, places full of boats, all trying to jockey for the best sunset picture of all the people walking along the bridge. I kind of like that one. This. From Mandalay, we went down to Bagan. This was our boat. We saw, the, along the way, saw a lot of the new modern big boats that they use, and I was actually so glad that we took one of these old funky boats, even when it rained in our cabin. Um, it was raining outside, but it was also raining in our cabin. Um, but it was great. Uh, sunset on the river as we're cruising down the river. Dawn the next morning. Our mode of transportation in Bagan, an area with something like 3,000 temples. Uh, it was something like 12,000 in the 11th century, but this is what's left. Road paving equipment uh, in Myanmar. Uh, <laughs> travelers with the same sort of mindset. Uh, I love this. I, I would uh, like to have had one of those shirts, but I couldn't take of a single way to ask for it that wouldn't have been misunderstood. <laughs> Getting up where you could look out over and see just everywhere you looked were just more and more of these temples. But one of the things, again, to emphasize what was great about this equipment is there were some really narrow places. And when we were coming up to the top of this temple to be able to look out the others, there was one little narrow passageway we had to climb up through. And as we were coming out, I was stuck. I couldn't move. And it was this little backpack that I had that had my camera in it. And fortunately, our guide was right behind us, and he was able to pull my backpack off. So if I had had that camera bag, it would have never made it. That old camera bag would have never made it up here. Hitting the markets, amazing places. I love markets in the rest of the world. And I'm going to hit you with just one last little thought that I know is a big part of what Bill wants to talk about. But that is, I mean, I have had an amazing life professionally, and I've learned a lot by being around a lot of really great people that knew a lot and shared it willingly. I've been fortunate with all of that. 
But the bottom line in what we do is always, first and foremost, the light. It's always about the light. What, what kind of light are you getting? Because the subject is not static. The subject changes based on that. What's the right time of day to photograph the Vatican? Morning, afternoon, nighttime. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Vietnam or at Tybee where we'll be in the morning. Detroit, Maine, Italy, a few blocks from here at Forsyth Park. The picture is really the light. It's not so much about location, although it's great to be in some of these wonderful locations. But I think it was probably one of the last BPA workshops I did was in Phoenix. And I think we were staying, was it Camelback we were staying at? And we were doing one of our early morning field trips. And I don't remember why, what happened. There was some mix up. We didn't have transportation or something. So we wound up doing that early morning sunrise workshop at the back of the parking lot. And that's the picture I got in the parking lot at the hotel where we were doing the convention. So it's about attitude, it's about seeing, it's not about hardware, as important as the hardware is. So thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here, and I do hope you enjoy my hometown. <laughs>